Welcome to Digital Designs podcast by Injaz. Today we're going to talk about education, entrepreneurship, and technology. I'm your host, Mohanir Jarrah, and thank you for being with us today. Before we start, I wanted to give you a background why we are doing these podcasts. Injaz is hosting 12 MIT students that are coming from the US to teach coding and website to more than 100 youth from different universities along with experts from Destination Imagination who are experts in the innovation process. Today, our podcast will be around Beyond Coding. But before we start, we'd like to say that uh, in this bootcamp, we have Jordanian minds who are meeting American minds to talk about coding and to know about different cultures. Today, we have two special guests. Nathan, who you are from uh, one of our MIT students who you're leading a three days workshop, uh, a three weeks workshop with more than 100 youth, Jordan youth in Jordan. And we have also a special guest, Ruba. Ruba, who is a student at the American University in Madaba and who is joining the uh, boot camps, coding boot camps that are run by MIT. Welcome to Injaz Podcast. So before we start uh, and do a deep dive into the technical of coding, we want to talk a little bit about culture. So we've been here in Jordan for more than two weeks. So tell us about your experience about Jordan. Uh, did you like our food? We'd like to know more <laughs> about that. Yeah, of course. Thank you for thank you for asking. I think Jordan, for me, has been an absolutely wonderful experience. It's been great in the sense of not only have I really appreciated everyone around me, everyone is incredibly friendly. I think a lot of times, even when there were barriers in language, and I don't know any Arabic, but everyone was great about trying to communicate whatever way possible. People want to get to know me, to understand more about how I grew up, and I love doing the same to talk to them and understand how they grew up. Of course, as you mentioned, food food here has been Fantastic. Uh, so Mohammed with the Injaz team, when we were first here on the first day, he said Jordanian food is the best in the world. And I was like, OK, well, that's a very big claim. I have to see how it uh, how that works out. And I can say that's that's been very close to true for me. Uh, I love the cuisine here. I love lamb and Jordanian food has a lot of lamb in there. It's been great. I, I think I've tried I've tried enough dishes. I don't know if I've tried every single dish that uh, that's traditional, but I think I've tried hopefully as, as many as I can in, in these uh, two weeks, and I've, I've loved every single one of them. So it's, been, it's been wonderful. That's great. So did you try mansaf and shawarma? I did, yes. Yeah. Shawarma, I was eating shawarma almost every day for the yeah. first week until I couldn't even <laughs> eat anymore. <laughs> and mansaf has been amazing. It's It's been great. And I, I have to thank the Injaz team as well for taking us out very consistently to different places that they love in Amman. It's uh, that's been the part of the cultural exchange that I've appreciated the most of. I love sharing meals with people because I think it's a great way to talk and to understand someone. And, and just team has uh, taken us to a lot of food places over the last two weeks. That's great. That's great to hear. So that what's the most important intake for you about Jordanian culture? I mean, what's the thing you really uh, you liked? I think the parts that I've really enjoyed are the similarities for me, at least to to know. So I think at least from my own perspective on American culture, I think realizing that a lot of the values I share are the same in Jordanian culture. So, you know, prioritizing uh, family, thinking about education, all of those attributes. I, I can see all the students I've spoken to think a lot about their family, think a lot about education, the future. And those are things that I really appreciated seeing. And then also it was really interesting for me to see the amount of media culture that we all share similarly. So I think talking to uh, some of the students and realizing, oh, we've been listening to the same types of music for years now, uh, we've been watching the same shows. That's That's been uh, wonderful for me to hear about as well. It's, it's, it's also really interesting for me to see with some of the other students and some of my friends on the MIT side, they were bonding and talking about watching shows that, you know, aren't American, that are Japanese or Korean. And it turns out everyone's been watching <laughs> kind of the same thing. So realizing that, you know, no matter how far apart we are, there's still so many things that are similar. 
that's been very, very yeah. great for me. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, with cultures, there's a lot of similarities and there are differences. And uh, right. it's interesting to see how much things are similar from different cultures. Yeah. And of course, there are some uniqueness. I'll, uh, about you, Ruba, how was your experience uh, through the uh, almost two weeks now? You are in the boot camp and uh, you are uh, also a participant uh, in the boot camp and you're uh, seeing the MIT students uh, delivering, you know, the coding uh, bootcamp. What's your thoughts, uh, impressions about uh, the culture and what's happening through this experience? We'd like to hear more about yeah. it. Well, actually, it was a great opportunity to, to communicate and talk with MIT students with, from the such a great background in coding and taking stuff. And the entire experience was actually uh, very, very uh, wonderful. And to have such such communication with such students from a uh, far away country that I've never thought about meeting and stuff, and bonding with them and talking with them and uh, like communicating uh, and talking about the same uh, projects, same issues that we have uh, recently like uh, studied and stuff. It was amazing, and to see how differently they think and how they solve problems that we would like think about in another way that we've never thought about they they totally we've learned so much from them and it was amazing actually that's great now <clears throat> um to, to move more into the technical component about coding and when we talk about coding you know the first thing uh, what's coding is it for me is it only for smart uh, youth with gpa 4.0 <laughs> nathan tell us what's coding about how do you describe coding and tell us more about uh for who is coding really who should learn uh, yeah of coding? course so i think coding a lot of people have this vision of some hacker in a fancy room who's a genius and who's mastered computers since they were three years old. That's absolutely not true. I think coding, the way that I see it is there's a lot of different languages that you can use to program and understanding how to code is learning these languages and how to basically control a computer and tell it to do what you want it to do. And I think the number one myth that I've, I've realized myself as well as hopefully everyone over these last two weeks has realized is coding is definitely for everyone. And I think there's many, many professions where even if you don't immediately see the value of programming, that it's very applicable and could help you to do things a little bit better. And that's one of the things that I realized. I never started off with a computer science background. That was something that I picked up when I was first entering in college. And so there's people around me that had already had years of experience in computer science. And at first it was very scary for me, but then I realized it's just like learning a language or learning a new skill in any other subject. You have to approach it from the beginning. Don't be too afraid of, uh, am I gonna be able to do this or not? Just take it one step at a time and you'll eventually develop lots of skills and learn everything. And of course the field advances so much every couple months that even if you're starting now, you're still going to have to be continuously learning. So you're never too far behind compared to where everyone else is. That's great. So like in the US, when do you start uh, learning about coding? Is it at school level or university or when you usually? So it varies for everyone, actually, very yeah. surprisingly. I think in recent years, there's been a push for younger and younger individuals to learn coding. So now I think a lot of people are having their first exposure in high school, maybe even middle school, depending on, on where you are. For me, I didn't really have much exposure to programming until I was later in high school and entering college. But I would say on average, I think it's starting to go towards high school now, high school. where a lot of high schoolers are, the classes are, are being incorporated. But it wasn't, that's, a, that's the most surprising change because high school is only a couple years behind for me, so only four years ago. Yeah. And now there's more people doing coding than when I was in high school. So it's growing. Ruba, when did you start? Uh you learn about coding. Is it uh, something new at university or is it at school? Can actually, you share your experience with okay. us? Actually, in the Jordanian curriculum, we do have coding. Uh, I think in middle school, we took like HTML, only the basics and elements and stuff. So um, they they try to like uh, guide you in what, what field you're actually interested in to help you like find your uh, major that, that actually you want in college. So that's actually when I was like, oh yeah, I want to continue doing that. So I decided to uh, go to uh, the IT industry and study like data science and AI. 
So, but like I took it seriously when I started college, of course. College, uh, yeah, uh, but exactly. you took some uh, yeah, some, initial program. Yeah, some uh, fundamentals in high school. That's great. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear this. Uh, I want to also, uh, I know in your boot camps, you are, you have certain sessions on AI, artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. and now uh, the world is changing with artificial intelligence. So what's AI? How, what's the definition of AI? Can you uh, explain it to us from your point of view? Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, how, how do you describe it? Yeah, so, so I think AI can be many, many different things. A lot of people right now have this idea in their mind where AI is a robotic mind that's going to be smarter than us and do all sorts of things. I think that's, that's one component that maybe isn't a reality yet. Maybe it could be. But really, AI is... Uh, it's a program that allows you to better understand data, better understand images, to do classification tests, to do all these different things. And that kind of begins with machine learning. And it's progressed over at a very, very rapid rate into all sorts of different models that are capable of many different things. So video generation, text generation now is is very huge. But in the or- origins of all of this, it was really just uh, models that could learn from data much better than previous iterations of algorithms and different things. So that's what I would say it is. It's it's more of uh, things that are able to learn from inputs or even create new data. I noticed also in your um, uh, bootcamp agenda that you're also looking at the safety of AI. Yeah. And uh, so do you think using AI is, is a safe uh, way of doing it? Or what are the measurements that uh, should be there in corporates and companies or in the educational system? Yeah, I think AI safety and ethics overall is an extremely important topic to teach. And we've been glad to cover this topic just because there's been so many recent uh, not necessarily incidents, but so many recent discussions that have been brought up around AI safety. And I think we have this idea of long-term AI safety where maybe an AI is smarter than us or something, but in the short term, there's a lot of other things. For example, if you're training a model to decide who should get a credit card or who should get a loan, understanding how this model may be biased or maybe giving wrong loans or wrong information is, is really, really important for hiring. All, there's so many situations where AI is being used, maybe in medicine or other things, and ensuring that these models are safe isn't necessarily that they could harm people directly, but rather to make sure that the outputs of these models <clears throat> are going to be fair. So I think that's that's the part of AI safety where a lot of researchers at MIT and other universities are, are very concerned about. Thank you. And Ruba, um, you, do you use AI in your studies now in Jordan? In your, are you doing any AI programming or any of that? Uh, yeah, of course. Actually, I'm an AI major. Mm-hmm. But actually, the fact that AI is now like uh, is a part of our lives, like using ChatGPT and stuff. So that made like the entire uh, process of education it to, like forced it to change. Like now we have to adapt to having ChatGPT. Like we now all know that we use ChatGPT for assignments, for writing essays and stuff. So so now that the professors have to think out of the box to give us like assignments to actually evaluate us, knowing that we are gonna use ChatGPT. So I think that's a, a very uh, benefit of having such things uh, and having AI to do such such things. For example, they can tell us like go find this on ChatGPT and like. Give me, uh, an, uh, explain it to me, or give me another solution or stuff. So that's, uh, I think that's a way to AI to push us to create, to do out of the box, to think more and be more creative. So I think that's very, very good uh, thing to do. That's great. Um, through we were chatting just before we uh, started the podcast, and you told me um, you have done an internship program. Yeah. And uh, through this internship, you were the first, uh, you were the only actually. Uh, uh, female you know, female in, the in the group. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us more about that uh, since you were the only one and yeah. uh, what challenges faced you and how did it go? Well, yeah, being a girl in tech is actually very challenging be, because like there, there are no, not many girls uh, in that field. So when I've done that internship, I was the only girl in that company. Um, at first, like I was very, very stressing like and, and not comfortable there. 
So the thing is that you have to gain their trust. They're gonna not gonna trust you, or like they're gonna underestimate you. So you have to prove yourself uh, and a little bit more than any other male getting into into that position. So yeah, I don't know. I just did my best and showed them what I can do. Proved yeah, yourself. I proved myself. And actually, it, it, uh, it's in college. Uh, like the girls in the RT faculty are like one percent. Most of them are guys. That's good. So what's your advice for all the young women who are hearing you about getting into IT and getting into digital, uh, you know, encoding and AI? Do you encourage them? Well, if you feel like you belong here, don't let anyone let me let you down or change your, change your mind. Uh, just do it. <laughs> I mean, just be yourself and they're going to come for you. Okay, and uh, Nathan, from your perspective on gender inclusivity and gender justice in, in tech and AI and digital world, what's your thoughts on this and what's the, your experience from the U.S. perspective on that uh, domain? Yeah, I think it's extremely important. It's similar to Jordan in the sense that it's a continuous effort, but improvements are being made every single day. I think from my perspective is more of as an instructor, but also I've kind of grown up with seeing a lot of women in tech. I mean, my my mom is a woman in tech, my sister is also. So okay. it's been very familiar for me from kind of a young age. So I think there's a, a culture shift that started some time ago, but, but has definitely been continuing and, and increasing of having more women in tech in the US. Uh, which is, I'm also very glad to see this happening in Jordan too with our students. From my perspective as an instructor, it's creating examples and creating curriculum that is gender inclusive. So it's using words that uh, make sure that it's clear that the examples, if you're using a programming problem or something, that it's not geared towards one gender in particular, but it could be inclusive to everybody. You know, I was reading recently an article on creativity and how creativity is interlinked with technology. So how do you see uh, these two, uh, you know, components or uh, connected? Do you see creativity is really in, uh, connected with technology and digital designs and coding or re- what's the relationship from your point of view? I think they can go hand in hand. So I don't have a lot of experience with uh, art in relation to technology, but I've seen an explosion of art that's been aided and assisted by technology in in recent years, especially when it comes to image generation. I think in some ways it's uh, democratizing uh, in the sense that I can't draw anything, but with AI tools, I could create something that can picture what I'm thinking about in my mind. And that has its trade-offs and drawbacks for people that have been artists for a long time. But at least for me, it's been exciting just because now I'm able to create things that I didn't really have a hope of creating before this. And Ruba, what's your thoughts on creativity and technology? Um, Well, I think that uh, it always started to be like... uh, really creative but uh, like you, you can ask ChatGPT to like imagine any anything that in your, that's in your mind like Im- imagine a baby girl holding a banana or whatever so I think yeah as he said like it's it's very very impressive for someone who cannot draw or like if you are like trying to picture something but you cannot like get it out of, on paper or stuff so I think AI helps like uh, helps, helps us a lot also in presentations and stuff, if you want to do like a, a, an impre- impressive presentation, you can use AI and he, the AI can do a great job on that. My question now is regarding the bootcamp that you are uh, leading part of it. Um, can you share with our audience what's happening in these three weeks? Uh, I mean, what's the, the agendas you are looking at, how, the, how it's happening and what are the main topics you are yeah. delivering? Here yeah, of course. Us? So. Our bootcamp is essentially structured to cater to everyone, including if you didn't have any background in programming. So we start off with a bootcamp in web development and Python. So these are two separate blocks during the first week where we'll teach you the basics of Python as well as more advanced topics that are necessary to do AI and data analysis. Afterwards, in the second week, we progress towards more advanced topics on the web development side. So the whole goal of the web development is to develop a personal website and portfolio. So if you're applying to jobs or showing employers 
that uh, your coding experience. You can show them this custom design website that you put together with your experiences and everything. So that's one part of the curriculum in the web development sense. And then in the other sense, we're dealing with AI and data analysis. And so on the AI side, we're doing computer vision. So computer vision and then natural language processing. So natural language processing is the field of ChatGPT and all those other language related areas. And then computer vision is analyzing images and doing that sort of work. And so the second week of the curriculum, we teach the basics of natural language processing, curricula, uh, computer vision, and then data analysis. Mm -hmm. And the last week, all the students are going to work on an independent project. So that's centered in one of these three main themes. And at the end of the week, they have the chance to present their project, as well as the work that they've been doing with web development for their own website. So they'll have a complete AI project or data analysis project from a real data set, real images, real text, and be able to present that to their whole cohort. Yeah, we're looking forward for the presentation yeah. to see the outcomes. It looks very interesting uh, designs that are coming from these uh, three weeks. And Ruba, you are a participant in this uh, three-week uh, bootcamp. Um, what's your thoughts? Did you, what did you learn? What do you want to share with us? Actually, it was very beneficial and helpful seeing like uh, uh, the effort they have put into the presentations and the explanations and stuff. Uh, it was actually uh, so nice to re recap everything that I've taken in university. Uh, we've been helping each other like in fields where we, we are feeling like comfortable. We would like help each other around the tables and stuff. So and we would actually like uh, remember like, oh, I, I do want to do this project. And you would put like more effort on a specific field that you are actually interested in. And like communicating with the, the MIT students and stuff, that was actually very nice from yeah. them. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So you have uh, you had the chance to meet uh, the 12 MIT students and uh, listen to them, discuss with them. Yeah, 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 we did. We did that. We got like really close and bonded with each other and stuff. That's great. And <clears throat> this is a question for both Ruba and Nathan. And, you know, it's your advice uh, to the youth, uh, the young Jordanian youth who are now listening to this podcast and saying, yeah, I want to be part of this uh, mindset uh, of creativity and digital designs and coding. Do you think uh, how they should go about it? And do you advise that that's a set of skills that's needed going forward in their career and building their portfolio of skills and how they can uh, perceive this uh, going forward? Right. I think the barrier to entry should be low, as in don't think about it as something that's hard to do or difficult to do. I think there's always smaller steps to start at depending on what you're interested in. And now, you know, we have ChatGPT and all these great tools that can actually almost serve as instructors, even if you don't have programs around you available. I think if Injaz is running a program like this again next year, this would be a great place to start to learn some of the basics in Python as well as AI and web design and, and different sort of programs. But I think really a recommendation would be to seek out people that you know have done these things, learn from their experiences, try to find instructors that can teach you this information. And if you can't find instructors, then there's many, many online guides and resources that I'm sure uh, have been compiled for you all to, to learn this information. Actually, my advice is not about a specific field for anyone who feels like uh, is not motiva motivated. If you find yourself in a position that you find that you're not motivated and everyone around you doubts in you, make make proving them wrong your motivation and just work forward for that. And just try to prove your doubters wrong, I guess. Definitely. <laughs> Like one last thought is a more imaginary thought, like going to the future and looking at the classrooms at schools and with the, having the artificial intelligence inside and the chat GPTs and augmented reality and all what's happening. How do you, uh, how do you imagine a classroom in five years will look like in, in mid school? I think it'll be nice. I think yeah. one thing that I've realized is every student works at their own pace and understands things in a different way. And I think part of the issue with traditional classrooms has been, you know, you have one instructor and you have many, many students. It's hard for that instructor to interface directly with every student. So they make content that appeals 
to everyone on on average. But it might some students might not learn as well from that content. I think having AI agents in the classroom there with the students so that they can ask questions and query as the curriculum progresses and as it grows will help a lot of students understand content better, ask better questions, learn the material better instead of just saying, okay, I understood what he said, but I don't really know what that means. Rubal, how do you imagine the classroom in a school in a few years from now? I think it's gonna help like the kids especially like curiosity if you like having one specific question it can give you like a suggestion to like look forward and do some research if you are interested in that field so it's gonna actually like help them to to like uh, answer their questions and yeah that's it I would like to thank our two special guests today Nathan from MIT and Dubai from University of Madaba uh, you know, you're uh, leading the boot camp with the MIT and Jordan been really exceptional and uh, we are hearing so many uh, stories and positive feedback. So thank you for being us here in Jordan and we hope you enjoyed. And Ruba, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. And uh, to our listeners, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please feel free to share your feedback, share this podcast with your networks and uh, we hope uh, that we'll see you in, in our next podcast. Thank you very much.